good morning sorry for all of the interruptions uh, we'll begin with the book of jonah after that we'll look very briefly at the book of micah as well uh, so jonah is the prophetic book which talks about uh, the repentance that god wants to offer to the city of nineveh so in most of the other old testament prophetic books we see judgment being passed uh, but we do not see um, any repentance in any offer of repentance being given that's probably because those nations had already chosen and made their decision uh, so god had waited hundreds of years uh, giving every single nation a chance to repent and when that did not happen when the time of judgment finally came we see god speaking prophetically uh, and uh, saying that uh, they would be destroyed in a particular way so we see this happening in most of the prophetic books but over here this particular city of nineveh not so much the entire nation but this particular city of nineveh seems to have been um, populated by people whose hearts are still willing to maybe repent and so god gives them another chance so what we what we see from the book of jonah is uh, something that we don't really see in the other prophetic books and we don't realize because of that god is a god who wants to give people a chance to repent if there is even the slightest chance that a person will repent he will give that uh, you know invitation he will make that offer he will give them one more chance but most of the nations were not ready for that and uh, why do we say this so confidently because we see that um, you know in um, the book of genesis where god says i am going to wait uh, you know uh, 430 years or so approximately you know i am going to wait that many years and i'm still going to give a chance to these nations which are occupying the land of canaan maybe they will repent maybe they will change and then after that the time of judgment will come upon them so god is a god who always chooses to first offer a chance to people to repent if they still do not want to take that invitation then the judgment will come so here probably the lord sees in the hearts of these particular people in this particular city uh, a desire maybe an inclination to still have a respect for the living god so which is why in uh, jona we see that god is making this extending this offer to them and the instrument that he wants to use to offer this repentance is the prophet so he god sends the prophet and through the prophet he is offering a chance to these people to repent and uh, when jona is told about this he automatically realizes because he's a man who has been walking with god he knows the heart of god so when god says go over there and preach judgment to them and repentance automatically jona realizes oh i think god must have looked into their hearts and it looks like as if these people are going to listen and repent that is why god is sending me from here but this is not something which i want so he has his own desires and his desire is to see these people destroyed maybe because soldiers from that particular city uh, were you know part of some particular earlier invasion in the previous generation you know because in the previous generation one generation before the time of jona a lot of attacks happened from the assyrians so they would have picked their soldiers from different cities so who knows how terrible the soldiers from nineveh were the ones who came and you know wreaked havoc over here in the land of uh, israel so we don't know the details but jona seems to be very strongly holding on to some grudges these people specifically from the city of nineveh probably have done something to his people and he wants to see judgment come upon them but now god is saying go and preach judgment and repentance and so he begins to think oh it looks like these people are open and therefore god is asking me to go if i go and if i speak these people will respond they will be forgiven and then i will not see that judgment which i have been waiting for i want to see their destruction but i will not get to see it that you see is the um, um the 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 thing which is going on in his mind and uh, you know 
we too sometimes have uh, you know issues like that there may be someone that uh, who has hurt us and our family very badly and we would like maybe to see them being punished and then the when the thought comes to our minds what if that person repents what if that person turns to the lord you know and gets down on their knees then will you be willing to just say oh it's good it's good that they have been restored or will you be disappointed like jonah and think oh i will now not get to see that person destroyed you see that um, um tendency could be there even in our own hearts if someone has hurt us badly enough so here we see that um, one generation before jonah assyria was in a very very powerful state at that point of time because it had some very powerful rulers at that particular point of time they made attacks on many many nations including israel so at that point uh, nineveh might have taken a very active role in the attacks and uh, so jonah and the people of israel have this grudge in their hearts against uh, this particular city okay so now these are assumptions that we are making uh, but one thing we do know assyria did attack again and again in uh, you know in the previous generation the generation before jonah so we are assuming that why does jonah have a special hatred for nineveh maybe because of the uh, attacks uh, done by them and by the role specifically played by this particular city okay that is an assumption on our side so what do we know about jonah he is very much part of the northern kingdom he lives in a place called kath hefer and uh, when he is born uh, i mean in his generation now it is the time of jeroboam the uh, second i know whose name has been coming up a lot um, so we are familiar with jeroboam the second right he is the one who had a lot of military success so while the previous um, uh, uh, rulers were not that powerful jeroboam the second is in a very very strong position and uh, militarily he's he's been able to take back many of the places which were lost during the previous generations he reclaims back all of those places and in fact god uses jonah to prophesy and say that jeroboam will be able to do that so in fact jonah prophesies over jeroboam and says through this man many of the lands which were lost will be brought back to uh, the to the nation of israel and they will be able to reclaim them we see that in second kings chapter 14 verse 25 if someone could read out second kings chapter 14 verse 25 no i unless i have got my reference wrong second kings 1425 is wrong is it yes oh good so was my reference wrong what is the correct reference ah yeah okay so it's it's correct okay, fine yeah all right yeah okay so there are the translation based on the version fine perfectly fine oh. no no that's totally fine yeah yeah no that's totally fine so yeah so we see over here that a prophecy was given by jonah saying that jeroboam would be successful in uh, restoring the boundaries of israel so israel uh, was able to occupy this much land only in the time of david and solomon you know to this extent after that one by one they kept losing all the territories which god had given them so he is able to bring it back to its uh, original position geographically so this was like a um, you know a, a, a time when things were going well for the nation and now at a time like this god is saying go to the enemy and tell the enemy that i want to you know uh, give them a chance to repent and this is not something that jona wants to do 
So right now in this generation, when uh, Jonah is doing his ministry, Assyria is no longer in such a good position. Okay, It will again regain its power. It will again become strong. But right now, during this particular historical phase, um, Assyrian, the Assyrian kingdom is not going that well. Because earlier, there was somebody named Shalmaneser III who was um, the ruling the Assyrian kingdom. He was highly powerful, highly successful. But after his death, all of these powerful cities which are there in the Assyrian kingdom, you know, which he had conquered and which he had brought under his control, they all began to rebel. Because the man who came to the throne next, you know, Shalmaneser's son, his name was Shamsi Adad. Okay, so when Shamsi Adad came to the throne, he was not as strong as his father, and many of the cities began to rebel and say, "We want to have our independence. We no longer want to be under the Assyrian kingdom." So um, things were not going too well for the Assyrian kingdom. Um, and in fact, he, he dies at quite an early age, uh, Shamsi Adad. So, and his uh, son is not even old enough to sit on the throne. So his widow, she tries to run the kingdom. She tries to you know, um, retain control over all the areas which the uh, you know, earlier king had managed to gain. Uh, finally, once that boy grows up and takes the throne, uh, he is able to rule. Uh, and when he is ruling, what we need to remember and realize is that Nineveh was not the capital of Assyria at that time. It, it was a place called Kala, C-A-L-A-H. So Nineveh was not the capital at that time uh, of Assyria. It was another place named Kala. So uh, the, this son, he rules for a while. And then after his death, he is succeeded by uh, three of his sons. All of them rule for short amounts of time. So the historical records don't explain whether they died from a natural cause or whether they were murdered by all these people who are rising in rebellion. So we're not very sure of the details. But each of the three sons only rules for a little while. And there's a lot of political turmoil happening over there in the Assyrian kingdom. So Nineveh is one of the most powerful cities. Uh, you know, the, the, when we think of city, we think in terms of, you know, Bangalore, Delhi, Mumbai. Uh, which are just cities. If you go to the outskirts of the city, you'll just have open spaces. And if you keep driving, 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 you'll go to the next town. But you see, when you're talking about cities over here in the ancient world, these cities would be fortified. They would have their own fortifications, just like Jerusalem. There would be a nice fortification wall around it. They would have their own security forces. Uh, the people living inside the city would be in a more influential and um, you know better financial position. So. Uh, they were almost like independent units. A city can function for almost a year on its own, you know, even if it doesn't get support from anywhere else because they have all the resources inside. They have their own little army, you know, which is there to guard the city. So these cities were in a good position. Uh, and so Nineveh was something like that. Nineveh was in a position of uh, influence and control. So the officials and the local um, leader of Nineveh, they wanted their own independence. They no longer wanted to be part of uh, the Assyrian kingdom. So they were fighting back. But the danger was always there that maybe the Assyrian emperor will come and you know with his army and wipe them out because of all the rebellion that they are indulging in. So it is in this kind of an atmosphere that Jonah is being sent by God to preach repentance in Nineveh. So there's an uncertainty in Nineveh about what's going to happen. Will the army come and attack because of the rebellion which they are indulging in? Or will Assyria leave them alone because the king is not powerful enough to retaliate? They still don't. They're not very sure. There's a tension in the city. So the people are in a vulnerable state. They are a little afraid of what's going to happen. And at this point of time, when their hearts are open, their hearts are ready, at that time, God sends Jonah to this place. Um, and it's the same with most of us, if you have noticed. You know, we are more willing to respond to the Lord in a time of need. We are more uh, willing to respond to the Lord when he has, you know, uh, when, 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 when situations have not gone well and we have been humbled and we have been brought down. We are more open to 
you know reach out to god when things are going well uh, and everything is prosperous and fine then uh, people don't feel the need for god that much but here they were the people of nineveh in this vulnerable condition right now and god saw their hearts and he wanted to give them one more offer of repentance so that you know their future can be changed and so jonah is sent at this particular point of time and um, um they all the people repent you know we see that in the book of jonah but i'm not sure how many years the repentance lasted uh because once people repent and they come under god's protection the lord takes care of them he really takes care of his own but it looks like they left him after a while because about 10 years after uh, you know this incident um they uh, you know no nineve uh, is comes under the next dynasty which is ruled by tiglath pileser tiglath pileser is also part of the assyrian kingdom but he belongs to a different dynasty for instance if you look you know in south india if you look at the number of dynasties which ruled over the same area the area stays over there the region is the same but you have different dynasties coming and ruling so we see this this particular dynasty you know it's too weak it gets wiped out you have a new dynasty coming in tiglath pileser is the ruler and he fully takes control of all the cities establishes himself and the power of the assyrian kingdom begins to rise again so this is a small window of opportunity when nineve could have just completely come out and become fully independent under the power of yahweh they had that chance and they even I mean, the, the original inhabitants who were there at that time they even repented they even turned to the lord but it looks like uh, uh sometime maybe a five or six years later they go back into their idol worship i mean again this is an assumption because no details are given but if they had continued um, under the power of yahweh i'm sure god would not have allowed tiglath pileser to take control of nineve even if he was taking control of all the other cities god would have protected the ninevites so we don't know how long the repentance lasted but we do know that 10 years after jonah's visit after the repentance takes place tiglath pileser comes takes over all the cities which are rebelling and he establishes his dynasty and assyria starts getting more and more powerful and then finally in uh, so tiglath pileser comes to the throne around 745 bc yes and um, it is in 722 bc that northern israel right gets occupied by the assyrians so the assyrians become powerful once again and uh, the northern kingdom is defeated so this is just the historical background so that we will know that there's a lot more to the story of jonah than just a big fat whale and uh, uh, you know a, a plant in the end of the story okay there's a lot of detail involved this is a historical event people have this um, tendency to to almost talk about the story of jonah like as if it's just some fairy tale which someone made up no this is a historical story it is grounded in history there's a background to the story uh, there are events which take place as a result of this uh, event where the people repent uh, so we have so many um, things happening with you know with regard to uh, nineve okay so about 50 years after jonah's visit um which would basically be about 40 years after tiglath pileser comes to the throne he decides to change the capital city from kala to nineve that is when nineve becomes the capital city of the assyrian kingdom so, but at the time when jona was there it was just one of the powerful provincial centers it was not the capital itself so when we are reading the book of jona and it talks about the king and his nobles repenting putting on sackcloth and turning to the lord it's probably not talking about the assyrian emperor who's sitting you know um in in kala rather it's talking about the local leaders you know the local the, the king who would have been there for that particular city it's probably talking about him and his nobles and all the people of the land and it, this was no small city because you know we have the population count given right at the end of the chapter it was a large huge 
city and it had its own army it had its own administration it was you know in such a good state that they could even think of rebelling against the emperor that, that was the position of this city and they all choose to repent and turn to the lord uh, so just looking at the uh, structure of jonah chapter 1 of course is the uh, you know the introduction where we see jonah being the given the commandment to go and jonah decides not to go and so he takes a ship to tarshish why does he take a ship to tarshish why not take a ship to some other place because nineveh was situated north east of israel so he wants to go exactly in the opposite direction so instead of going north east he wants to go towards the west and uh, that is basically where you would have tarshish so he gets into a ship which is going in exactly the opposite direction to what god is asking for okay so um and then we know in chapter 1 we also have the details of how the storm comes and then the sailors are very worried for their life and then jonah has the decency to admit and say this is not happening because of anything that you people have done this storm is happening because of me god is judging me so if you throw me out of the ship then god will no longer you know um, uh, attack you he will only attack me and uh, so jonah in spite of his disobedience he still has uh, some sense of integrity on the inside and so he says you know you people throw me overboard so that god's judgment will only come upon me and it will not touch all of you and so he's thrown into the waters and of course we know that god sends a uh, a large fish to uh, swallow him so the general assumption is, is that it was a whale and uh, we don't know whether it was a whale or whether it was some other species but it was large enough huge enough to be able to swallow a grown up person and that person could actually stay inside its intestines for 3 days so which means it was a huge enough creature it is not just some tiny little fish it was something very very large similar to a whale so um, he stays inside uh, for 3 uh, days and obviously um even if we have a little bit of science background we will know what happens to food which you put inside your stomach right it starts getting um uh, digested so you have all the uh, gastric juices which are attacking it which are basically acids right you have acids uh, which are attacking the food and bringing it down to a um, you know state where it can be absorbed by the body so all that is happening to jonah during those days i'm sure god's protection would have been upon him to an extent but i'm sure it would have been a highly unpleasant experience so when he finally when the when the fish finally you know vomits and brings him out not particularly sure what condition he was in his clothes of course would have been a big mess so forget about his clothes but what about his skin if the acids worked upon his skin he would not be looking very pleasant anymore now maybe god divinely shielded him from the action of all the or the acids we do not know the details are not given jonah does not talk about his physical appearance over here so we do not know but if if the gastric juices worked upon him he would not come out looking the same as he was earlier he went through all of this misery because he refused to submit to the lord and do the ministry which was given to him so it's a very dangerous thing to say lord i don't want to do this ministry i think i'll go do that ministry that seems more pleasant no it would be most wise for us to submit to whatever form of ministry the lord is offering us to stay within the safe boundaries of his divine will okay that uh, that helps i we have a question here i'll just take a moment to look at Yes, here is who is the one who restored the boundaries? Um, that would be Jeroboam the second. Um, so that is what we read. I'm not sure if it is actually a statement. I'm assuming it's just a statement uh, because it says that very clearly in Second um, Kings that Jeroboam the second is the one who establishes it. if if there's a further follow up question to that uh, if it is a question uh, then yes you know you could post that and then i, I can address that uh, yeah but i'm assuming that you have just simply put the the verse over there 
yeah sorry okay uh, we were looking at chapter 1 yes uh, chapter 1 the structure of jona chapter 1 is so chapter chapter 1 gives us the opening details uh, then chapters 2 to 3 is where uh, you know he he preaches repentance to the people and the people believe that judgment will come upon them and they choose to repent uh, then chapter 4 um, is where god talks to jona and deals with his attitudes okay so jona needs to be corrected and that happens in chapter 4 uh, so uh, the contrast that we see two things two contrasts that we see between the book of jona and the other prophetic books like we said already in all the prophetic books we generally see only judgment being spoken because those people have already decided that they do not want to respond to the living god but here in this particular book we see even repentance being offered the other contrast that we see between jona and the other prophetic books is that in all of the other prophetic uh, books who are the villains the people who are respond or refusing to respond to god the people who are living in disobedience it's always the people either the people of the other nations or the people of israel they are the ones who are the bad party who is always the good party it's always the prophet the one man who is obedient and loyal and good but we see a reversal over here in the book of jonah in the book of jonah everyone is obedient to the lord except this one prophet he is completely living in disobedience so we see the storm obeying god we see the sailors obeying god we see the the king and the people obeying god everyone chooses to obey god except over here the one prophet who refuses to obey god so we see basically these two contrasts between this prophetic book and the other um, prophetic books um so yeah um jesus refers to this particular incident um in matthew 12 39 to 41 and of course in other in luke also uh but then maybe we can um, no yeah we bit it sorry right. so yeah in matthew 12 39 to 41 you know jesus says this generation is asking for a sign uh but he says the only sign that they will be given is the prophet jonah so the people are saying give us a sign that you are really from god that you really are the son of god and jesus gives them a sign saying i am giving you the sign of jonah so obviously jesus did not use a fictional story fairy tale sign he gives them a historical sign so jesus speaks about jonah as if he is a historical figure and as if the events which took place in the time of jonah are all real historical events um for instance in, if you look at matthew chapter 12 and you look specifically at verse 41 it says the men of nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it it's talking about how the people who got saved during that you know uh, event of repentance they they all will be present on judgment day so it's not talking about fictitious characters it's talking about actual people who repented during that time and when we go to heaven we will actually meet them we'll actually get to see them so this is a, this is a very much historical event um yeah uh, maybe in another four minutes if we can just very quickly look at you know um jona and that leafy plant and then we can move on into uh mica because mica this very less detail mentioned even historical background is hardly anything mentioned so you know i'm just taking a little extra time for jona but we will also look at uh mica um so yes ha hmm yeah because it actually happened to some sailor you know if you look in if you look online okay the question being asked over here is is it even scientifically possible for uh, to be swallowed by a whale or you know some such large creature and still be able to come out alive uh, there have been incidents where um animals you know i mean other creatures have been swallowed and uh, they were able to come out alive uh, because 
the acidic juices since the gastric juices inside don't kill you they're not poison they just eat away at you so you would have a lot of living creatures inside that huge holding area of the creature where the food all you know first goes in and then the gastric juices begin to act on it and slowly the creature which is inside dies so there is a story told that one um, person actually did get swallowed by a whale and he does come out alive now i don't know whether that's true or not i would have to actually go and see whether that's a reliable uh, report or not because sometimes people come up with silly fiction so don't know whether it actually happened or not but there is i've, I've read it somewhere didn't pay it much attention but you could look it up in the net and see if that's a reliable thing whether there was a newspaper article talking about it or not or it's just some made up uh, you know internet story so uh, it is possible scientifically possible okay just very very quickly coming to this last portion jonah is very very angry that the lord has you know forgiven the people and he is saying that he is not going to bring judgment upon them and so he is so upset that in chapter 4 uh or was uh 3 he says take away my life for it is better for me to die than to live uh, he is he 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 really wanted to see the judgment brought upon these people and he is extremely upset and then the lord says this in verse 4 is it right for you to be angry are you justified in being angry is the question which god asks and jonah does not give an answer over there and then this particular incident happens where he's you know he goes and um, sits on the east side of the city because he's still hoping that maybe the judgment will come down from heaven and so he just wants to wait and see what's going to happen just in case god changes his mind so he's sitting over there waiting to see what's going to happen and then while he's sitting over there there's no shelter it's a uh, open land you know what the middle eastern heat is like right so this poor man is made some kind of temporary shelter for his head is sitting over there and god miraculously makes a creeper grow so that it can cover his head and give him some shade and it says in um, where is it it says in verse um 5 i think uh, or 6 he says he was very happy he was so happy that god had done this miracle and provided him with a a uh, shelter and then the next day it says verse 7 uh, god allows some you know some infection to come into that plant some worm comes and infects it it begins to chew up the plant and the creeper dies so now he's again back in the sun and on that particular day god deliberately brings a scorching east wind a hot scorching east wind and this poor man is sitting out in the open no shelter nothing and he thinks my goodness first of all i didn't get my heart's desire to see this particular city destroyed and now i'm going through this terrible condition because you see he felt relief for one day the shade was on upon his head a miracle took place he was happy and now that also is gone and so a second time he cries out and he says in uh, verse 8 he says um he grew faint he almost fainted you know uh, so he's probably very thirsty probably hungry uh he's almost fainting and he says he wanted to die he says it would be better for me to be to die than to live and now god asks a second question which is in verse 9 is it right for you to be angry about the plant and then god uh, so what is jonah's reply he says it is okay very confidently he says yes it is indeed justified for me to be angry uh, and he says i'm so angry i wish i were dead Okay, so then God says to him, "Did you create the plant? Did you take care of it? Did you make it grow? Did you do anything for it? No, but you're so concerned about it. On the other hand, these people of Nineveh, I created them, I took care of them, I caused them to grow up, I I met their needs, I provided them rain with sunlight. After doing so much for them, should I not be concerned?" you are so concerned about a plant which you never even did anything for you didn't even take one glass of water and pour water for it and you're so concerned about it on the other hand when i show mercy to the people whom i brought up for an entire generation you are so angry so is it right for you to be angry it is an amazing object lesson which brings out uh, you know the 
lesson which God wanted to teach. And so he says, I am concerned for the city and not just for the city, even for the animals of the city. So we see that God is a God who loves all the nations. He has no desire to bring judgment upon them. But if they choose not to repent, if they choose to hold on to their idolatry, then judgment, yes, in the time, in the right fixed time, judgment will come. Okay, so that's the lesson that we see so clearly brought out in the book of Jonah. Just moving very quickly into the book of Micah, uh, for which we do not have many details. However, we, we see that Micah prophesied uh, to both the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom because there are prophecies given about how the northern kingdom will fall. We also see prophecies about how the southern kingdom will fall. And in fact, about 10 or 20 years after you know, Micah uh, begins his ministry, that is when the northern kingdom falls in 722. Okay, so, um, so he prophesies about both of the nations. And uh, Micah is basically popular and well-known for that one single verse, uh, Micah 5.2, where you have the pro um, prophecy about uh, the Messiah who will come. Um, if someone could read out Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Yes, so uh, whose goings are from old, from everlasting. In NIV it says whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. So this Messiah who will come will not just be someone who was born that day and started to grow up, but he will be from ancient times. So it's talking about an eternal, everlasting Messiah who... Um, was not born like other people, but who uh, always had existed. Okay, so we get to see the eternity of the Messiah being discussed over here. And we also see his, um, the, the location of where he will come and take birth in human form, very, very clearly told. So which is why later when Herod asks the chief priests and the scribes, you know, these people, the wise men have come and they're talking about some king who is going to come and take over uh, this land. Who is this king? And the chief priests and scribes very gladly tell him, we are waiting for our Messiah King, and we know that he is going to be born uh, in Bethlehem Ephrata. So they quote that verse to Herod and tell him about it. Um, so uh, if we look at the structure of Micah, uh, chapters 1 to 3 will talk about judgment, and chapters 4 to 5 talk about how he will restore the land of Israel once again. And chapters 6 and 7 are a cry for repentance. So in the same way God offered repentance to the people of Nineveh, here God is offering repentance and saying, if you will be willing to come back to me, I am willing to uh, you know, um, give you forgiveness and change the judgment. So we see that. Also another interesting thing that we see in the book of Micah is... Um, when Jeremiah is being attacked by people, you know, Jeremiah, because of all his prophecies and the people hated him for it, when he is being attacked, this is what happens. Um, there's a quotation which is made from the book of Micah. So just to give a little background, um, Jeremiah has been prophesying against uh, Jerusalem. He's telling that Jerusalem will fall. The people are very angry about it. And so the priests and the prophets decide to kill him. And when they, they, when they capture him, arrest him, and are getting ready to kill him, the officials of the city come and they say, why are you killing this man? Because once upon a time, Micah the prophet also gave a similar prophecy. And when Micah gave his prophecy in the time of Hezekiah, Hezekiah did not say, I'm going to kill you. Hezekiah, in fact, got down on his knees and he repented. So when Hezekiah heard the prophecy given by Micah that Jerusalem will fall. Hezekiah did not retaliate and say, I'm going to kill you for your word of prophecy. Rather, Hezekiah repented. And so the officials say to the priests and prophets, you should be getting down on your knees and repenting rather than taking action against Jeremiah. So in fact, they refer to Micah to you know provide an argument to spare the life of Jeremiah. 
So you would see this in Jeremiah 26, 8 to 19, where the details are given. So uh, this, this story is mentioned over there. Um, yeah, so these are actually just the two main things that we see in Micah. One is, of course, Micah 5, 2, where you have the prophecy of the Messiah who will come. And this other place where uh, the argument from the life of Micah is used to spare the life of Jeremiah. Okay, so we see these two um, main things in the book of Micah. So we have about two minutes left. Any other questions? Otherwise, we can close with a word of prayer. Yeah, shall we pray? Lord, we just thank you so much for uh, the lessons that you teach us from the lives of your people. Thank you, O Lord, for putting in these details in your word so that uh, we don't have to repeat the mistakes which they did, O Lord. Lord, um, we thank you that you are a God of mercy and compassion, uh, that, Lord, you do not um, hold on uh, to the sins which we have done. The way Jonah was holding on to the grudges you are not like that. And we thank you for that, for your great mercy, O oh Lord. And in the same way that you show us mercy and you forgive us, we pray that you would help us also to forgive other people in return and not hold on to grudges against them. The same way we have been shown mercy, help us also, O oh Lord, to show mercy to others and grant them forgiveness in the same way that you are forgiving us. Help us, O oh Lord, to have that kind of an attitude. Also, Lord, uh, we thank you for uh, the book of Micah. Thank you for the uh, prophecies that he gave, O Lord, faithfully to his people. And we thank you, O Lord, that he lived in a time where the king was willing to listen to your word and humble himself and repent rather than rising up in pride and saying, I do not want to hear God's word. So we pray, O Lord, that you would help us to be like Hezekiah when, his, uh, when something from you was told to him. He accepted it rather than rebel against it. Lord, help us to have these kind of attitudes in our own lives. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So thank you so much for those of you who are online. And uh, thank you to all of you who are in the class.